a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks the sea when I'm tossed it sends out a light that I
curse from which I stumbled and fell. Evil is banished to eternal hell. No more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying again, and praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the See all around, now the nations bow down to sing. The only sound is the praises to Christ our King. Slowly the names from the book are read. King, so there's no need to dread. No more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying again. And praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the risen Lamb. See over there, there's a mansion prepared. Savior eternally, no more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying again, and praises to over to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles with you, if you turn over there, and we'll follow along as we read a few verses and give you the thought that I think God will use. He's really used it in my heart. I, God's helped me with this, and I've been studying this most of the week, and uh, I don't like to study Monday for Sunday because it just consumes me. You know, you can't, you just can't. <laughs> You just go over and over and over and over and over just by Sunday. You're just almost at a frazzle. I feel that way with this message. I've been studying this message and looking over these chapters and reading these chapters for about five or six days and just trying to get God to help me to understand it completely that I might help you with it because it's really helped me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> I'll give you a few verses here and give you the thought that I trust God to use. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1, the Bible says, it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. 
God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. <clears throat> for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think me above that which he seeth me to be, or heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Verse number 9 is my text. as an expression that is just captured me this week, and it's this expression, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. And this story is so compelling to me because the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to give you some things here in just a minute that I trust to help you, but the, the idea of God's grace, the idea of that, I believe with all of my heart, grace, the grace of God is so misunderstood today. I believe the grace of God is misunderstood today because people use the grace of God as a free gift or a free pass to sin. God never gave you His grace to freely sin. God never gives you His grace. God never bestows His grace upon you. And by the way, grace is given, it's not earned. Grace is something God just of His own will, of His own free will, God just says, I'm going to give you grace. It's interesting that people think they can earn it. It's interesting people think they can merit it. It's interesting that people think that they have gained some type of favor with God and He owes them grace. Can I tell you, the grace of God is just that. It's God bestowing His love on you when you didn't deserve it. He, the, the, the very idea that you're here today breathing and upright and didn't need a wheelchair and didn't need a, some of assistance, just wherever you're at today is the grace of God. Every one of us in this room have a measure of grace. And, uh, you know, grace is not given to us that we might sin. The Bible even tells us don't use grace as an occasion to sin. Well, I can just, I, I'm a Christian, I can sin. I'm a Christian, I got a free pass, God will forgive me. You better not live that way. You don't live your life in such a way that, well, I'm a Christian, I've got, free, uh, I've got a free pass, I just pull out the pass when I sin and God's grace will be sufficient. That's not, that's not the way God intended grace. The Bible says in Romans 6, the Bible says, we sh Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God does not intend for you and God does not intend for me to live our life under grace, yes, but not to abuse it. Not to take it and throw it under the, under the dirt, in the dirt, if you will, or under the rug. Or God's grace is precious. God's grace is amazing to think that God loves us in spite of us. One day I was asked about being a pastor and a preacher and we were talking about this and a particular lady said, you know, a lot of times a preacher is not what he should be. I said, that's exactly right because we're sinners. And a pastor and a preacher falls or someone does something wrong or says something they shouldn't say or you know and it goes. And he said, she said, why does God use that man in that? Why do they use him anyway? I said, because God's grace uses us in spite of us. Because God chose to use a man. God chooses to use a woman. God chooses to use children. God chooses that. And that's called grace. He tells us here that Paul is making it very clear that the grace of God is profound. Notice what it says, verse number 9. He says, He said unto me, so no doubt Paul was beseeching the Lord, and you can find verse number 8, he says that he sought the Lord thrice. Man, he must be a really good Christian because I seem like I seek the Lord 300 times. He just sought Him thrice over. You know, something about that is profound because it's like he got it settled. He, he asked once and 
God didn't answer maybe, and he asked again, and God didn't answer. He asked a third time, the Bible says, and when he asked a third time, God answered him. And he never asked again. Pretty interesting. I am always seem like I'm coming to the Lord with the same old things. And Lord, here I am again. Lord, here I am again. Here I am again. Paul just got it settled. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to live with it. He said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, the interesting thing about grace, I love this, that grace, the amount of, gra- amount of sin you have, grace, God has enough grace to cover it. Amen. You know, it's interesting. The devil will tell you two things. The devil will try to get you to think you're too bad to be saved or too good to be saved. Because if you're too bad to be saved, well, I'm so bad, I'm so far gone, God can never save me. That's one of the lies of the devil. Another lie of the devil is you're too good to be saved. Well, I've never killed anybody, I've never uh, drank, I've never smoked, I've never done, you know, they list whole kinds of lists of things, and they say, well, I've never done that, so I've got to be a good guy. No, every last one of us is in need of grace. It doesn't matter what, what house you grew up in, it doesn't matter what family name you have, you need just as much grace as everybody else does. You, you may not have the amount of sin, you may not have had the amount of things that we put in our mind, categorize it. You know, God doesn't categorize sin, by the way. Sin is sin, singular. But we, we pluralize it and make it sins. Well, I don't do this, so, well, I don't need as much grace. Yeah, you need as much grace as I do. The young child needs just as much grace as a drunkard on the streets. We need just as much grace. And when I think about God's grace and I dis, dis, uh, dissect God's grace, I think about some things. The goodwill, you know, God signifies His grace by His goodwill toward us. Why does God give us grace? Because He has a good will intended for you. The devil has an ill will intended for you. The devil wants to wreck you, wants to ruin you, wants to destroy you, wants to take you to hell forever. But God's grace signifies He's got a good will for you. He's got purpose for you. He's got direction for you. He's got some sort of idea in His mind for you. That's His good will. Another one is His good work in you. You know, the Bible says that God will perform the good work He started in you through grace. Grace is always going to be the connection point. So I'm going to give you three ways out of this portion of Scripture that I think the Apostle Paul was using grace. There's three significant times that we need grace. Very profound, so hold on. The first one is Paul's past. Would you right now somewhere, you're going to need God's grace for your past. Every last one of us in this room, if any of these points you missed today, get this one. Because this one has helped me more than anything that I've studied out of this message is the first point of the past. You know what the devil wants you to do? The devil wants you to wallow in the past and, and, and dwell in the past and, and swallow yourself in the past and live in the past. The devil loves your past. You know that? The devil's always bringing up your past. The devil's always resurfacing something that God's done put under the blood. If you're living this morning as a Christian and if you're living in the past, you're doing yourself a disservice. Because you're allowing the devil to reiterate the past and reiterate the past and reiterate the past in your mind. The Apostle Paul does something profound to us. In verse number 1, won't take time to do it, verse number 6, he begins giving us the story. The Apostle Paul, outside of the Lord Jesus, was the most godly man, I believe, in the Scripture. The Bible even says it's not, well, the book, the book of a... Uh, John, uh, Jesus tells us there's no greater woman born of woman than of John. So we know John. But Paul, in the Christian world, John and, and Peter and Paul and apostles, but Paul sticks out to me because God uses Paul and he uses him in his affliction. No other apostle, no other disciple that I ever read about that it suffered so much persecution than the apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was used mightily, and so he knows what he's talking about. So if you read those verses, he begins talking about the experience he had 14 years ago. When I read 14 years ago, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why do you mean 14 years? Why did God mention 14 years? And I can't help but think the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart. It seemed like he took that long for him to talk about it. I think it took 14 years. That's not like me. That's probably not like you. As soon as something happens, we have an experience with God, we're going to tell people about it, aren't we? We're always eager to tell people about the glory stories, aren't we? 
We're always eager to tell, well, God did this with me, and God did this with me, and God did... I think it took 14 years for Paul to wrap his mind around it, for him to even tell it. He said 14 years ago, and then when he even speaks about it, verse number 1, 2, 3, 4, he gives very little detail about what it is. He tells us, tells us that he, he's in, a, uh, in the heavens. The first heaven is the stars, and uh, the second heaven is the galaxy, or the sun, the moon is the first heaven. The galaxy is the second moon, and, uh, seven, second heaven. And the third heaven is where God is. He said he went to the third heaven. He went all the way where God was. He said, I heard things that man does not need to utter. But it took him 14 years to talk about it. I believe the grace of God kept his mouth closed. You know what the grace of God was doing in Apostle Paul's life? I believe with all of my heart. He kept his mouth closed for 14 years because he knew Paul would glory in that, in that experience. He knew Paul would glory in that great big experience that no other man that we know of according to Scripture have ever had that kind of experience. His past... Yet glory, he said, i tell you what I'm not going to do. He said, I'm not going to glory in that because I'd be a fool. The grace of God taught him that. The grace of God taught him to keep your mouth closed when God does something with you and for you. He said, verse 4, he said, he was caught up into paradise. I mean, he was where God was and heard unspeakable words, which was not lawful for a man to utter. He said, of such one I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Verse number 7, the Bible says, God did something for him that looked like on the surface hurtful, but it was actually helpful. He gave him a thorn in the flesh. He gave him something that he could never forget about. Every morning he woke up, every day he walked around, every night when he went to bed, he thought about the thorn that was in his flesh. There's so many speculations of what that was, and many say this, and many say that. I don't know, but we do know his eyes. He had trouble with his eyes. He was a sickly individual, and on and on it goes. But whatever that thorn is, and I believe God kept that thorn silent for one reason. I believe this all in my heart. So you could identify with whatever thorn it is. I don't know what your thorn is today. I don't know what, what is hindering you today. I don't know what it is, but I do know this. God gave the Apostle Paul a thorn in his flesh, one, to keep him humble, but two, to remind him that God gets the glory for it. If we're not real careful, listen, I'm telling you what it is. If we're not real careful, we'll get in a glory story and for some reason we want to get the glory for it when it all belongs to God. He tells us here, don't let your past hinder. Don't let the devil use your past to miss the grace of God. I, I wrote some things on the screen because I want you to get these. I wrote three things down that I really want you to get. It's interesting, when I read the, I was reading some commentaries on this, and there's three things I want to show you. It's on the screen. It's our tendency to disconnect from our past we didn't like. Every one of us in here has something in our past that we don't like that we did. And the devil wants us to reiterate that and bring that up and up and back in our, in our life so we can be hindered. But the truth is, you can't disconnect from your past. You can't unplug your past and act like it never happened. I'd like for it to be. I, I used to wrestle with the Lord some. Why did I wait? Why did I wait till I was 23 years old? I mean, when I got 16, 17, up till I was 23, I lived in the world. I lived after the flesh. I lived off of the, the things of the world, and there's no sense to go in detail, but I lived for the devil. And I used to struggle. Why in the world did I wait till I was 23 before I got saved? Why did I wait? Why did I wait? And I used to wrestle with the Lord about that, and I think, why in the world did, did I wait? And then one thing dawned on me one day. I, got, I quit wrestling with God about waiting till I got saved because I think God could use my past. Not that no doubt God was willing to save me earlier, but I'm thinking I could have, now that I've grown, now that I've gotten older, I think God can use my past now that I can look at young people and say, hey, don't go down that road. Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, don't go down that road. It'll take you there. You can use your past for God's glory. But the devil wants us to dr keep us drugged down with it. Another one that I wrote down, your future is not complete without your present and your past. Do you know who you are this morning sitting in this building is because of your past? It's because of your present and God help you with your future? Everything that's ever happened to you, and I don't know all the circumstances, but do you know that has made you the person you are today? 
We need the grace of God with our past. And there's another one that I got, and this is tremendous. It's damaging to live in the past. I love this expression. This is one of the most profound things I've ever read when I read about the past. It's damaging to live in the past. If you're always living in the past, you're, going to live a, you're just going to live a defeated life. Well, I can't do this because this happened. Well, I can't do this because this happened. On and on it goes. Look, if, if I'm a testimony. If I was living in my past, God would not be using me today. If I lived in my past, listen to me, I'm telling you like it is because I know what I'm talking about. If I lived in my past, if I just dwelled on all the things that was going on back there and maybe family situations or, or this or that, if I lived in that, you would never do nothing for God. Never let the devil take your past and drug you through, drag you through the mud. The devil loves to drag you down with your past. Let it be used for the glory of God. Let it be used. Let God use your past. Paul was writing and says, Look, I had a great experience with God, but I'm not going to let that drag me down. He said he could get puffed up and proud. But I like this statement. It's damaging you live in the past. But God forbid we walk away from our mistakes empty-handed. That's tremendous. I wish we'd let that soak in just for a minute. We don't live in the past, but God forbid we walk away from the past. Walk away from the mistakes empty-handed or from others. I've learned, I've, God has put great men in my path, in my past. I look back over my life and I think of men that God used tremendously. I, I'm even thinking as a 13, 14, 15-year-old boy, I'm thinking of people now that are going through my mind that God, I didn't have any idea God was using, but He did to the positive. And could I tell you this? There's men in my path right now that I'm thinking that could have destroyed me and tried to, I feel like, in some measure. But if I live in that past, if I live in that realm, if I live in that, I'm going to, it's going to stifle me for the glory of God. As just as a, as a young boy, I'm talking about a seven, eight, nine-year-old boy, there's pictures of me giving my family members beer and feed it to them as a boy. As a child, I remember sitting as a young boy, sitting on a bar stool. One of my family members set me, took me into a bar as just a child, just a small child, and set me on a bar stool and pretended to be drinking and going on as a child. Well, I could say, well, see, I'm a drunker nowadays because of that. That's a bunch of nonsense. Just because it happened in the past, just because it took place there somewhere that you had no control over, that you had no uh, direction over, and it was nothing that you had anything to do with. Look, God can still use your past for others. Sure He can, but you'll need the grace of God to do it. You'll need the grace of God to do it. Don't let your past stifle your present or your future. If your past is under the blood... Don't carry it with you through life. Look, I can't, I can't wallow in what I didn't do or what I did do to stifle me for the future. I think about Joseph's brothers. My wife's going through a Bible study and studying the life of Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and all the brothers. There's a, there's a verse in Genesis 42, 21. The Bible says that the brothers, when they took away Joseph out of the family... The Bible says in verse 21 that it came back around to them. And they, it was discovered that it was their fault that they did not take care of Joseph. And the Bible says that it has come back to us, basically. They reap what they sowed. The past had come back toward them. And when I read that, I think about that sometimes because they... they exempted themselves from the grace of God. Verse 9, it says again, he says, My grace is sufficient for thee. That is after he gets the thorn in the flesh. He said, verse number 7, he says, Given to me a thorn in the flesh and a messenger of Satan to buffet me. He, to, to put him in his place. To, to buffet him. You ever heard of the need a buffer? I need someone to, to buffet. He said here, he said, he give me that. Verse number 9, he gave me that, verse number 7, excuse me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Do you know what my past does to me often? When I begin to reminisce about my past, it causes me to think of how good 
God's been to me. Because if it were not for the grace of God, if He had not intervened in my past, I would be a wrecked individual this morning. But because of His grace, He intervened. And how many young people, how many people are sitting in this room that may have had a wrecked past except the grace of God intervened? It's his past. The second one I see, notice with me here, it's the present. Do you know you need the grace of God for the very present? You can't live this life without God's grace. And why would you? Why would you want to live this life without the grace of God? Why would you want to get up every day and, and go through your day? And we do, by the way. But why would we want to go through this day, go through this life without the grace of God? If you'll read verse number 7 down to the verse number 10, he begins to almost like reconsider. He said, I remember I get a thorn in the flesh. I, God did that for my good. Verse number 8, for this thing I thought, saw, uh, sought for it thrice. Verse number 10. Verse number 9, excuse me. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So we don't want to major on the thorn in the flesh. We want to major on the grace is sufficient. See, you and I, and we're most negative in a lot of areas I am in my mind, but we want to, we want to focus on the thorn, don't we? I always want to thorn. It's a thorn, it's a thorn, it's a thorn, it's a thorn. But I don't believe the emphasis is on the thorn. I believe the emphasis is on the grace. He, he's not saying, poor me, I've got a thorn. Poor me, I've got poor eyesight. Poor me, I've got whatever. Poor me, I've got this thorn in flesh. He's not saying that. You know what he's saying? He's saying, it's not the thorn, it's the grace. It's the grace that's causing me to go on. It's the grace of God that causes me. Yes, my past is bad. Yes, I don't like what happened. But look here, the present is I still need the grace of God. Paul said, I'm, I've got this thorn. I can't do anything about it. It's under the water. It's under the blood. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Most people get upset with God when He don't take away the thorn. But God doesn't want to take away the thorn. But I wish He would. I wish He'd pull it out. I wish He'd remove it. I wish I could just take it away. The truth is... The cold hard facts, if he took away the thorn, you wouldn't be the person you are today. If he did, if he removed the obstacle, if he removed the thorn, if he removed the, the disappointments, if he removed your past, if he removed that person out of your past. You know, people. I know people talk about their past, say, I wish that person would just die. I wish they would just leave and never be. You know, you will never get rid of your past until you confront it. You will never, you will never get past it. Unless you confront it. People want to get rid of it. People want to say it never happened and I wish it never took place. Let's turn it around and let God use it. Let's turn it around and let God get the glory for it. Let's turn it around. Let's turn that, that past that we don't like into the grace of God. The present. That's that present. Look, you can never live a victorious Christian present life without the grace of God. 2 Peter 3.18, he says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in grace. Grow in that grace. How do you do that? You do that in the present. I wrote this down. Grace is the centerpiece of our salvation. Everything you are today is because of grace. You're saved today by grace. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a Savior. Today, it's because of grace. If you serve the Lord Jesus today, it's because of grace. It's all around the grace of God. We need it for the past. We need it for the present. We definitely need it for the future. If I'm going to do anything for God from this moment forward, it's got to be through the grace of God. Paul said in verse number 13, he says, For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. I want you to see something here, church. Verse 13, the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians ever lived, is confessing his faults and confessing that he did something wrong. Hallelujah. When's the last time you just confessed of doing something wrong? You know what that takes? That takes the grace of God. 
You know you forfeit, listen to me right here, you forfeit the grace of God when you go with unconfessed sin. You're forfeiting. You're forfeiting God's wonderful, marvelous, matchless grace when you refuse to live in the presence of God's grace. That's tremendous. That is profound because, look, if we get the past taken care of and we get the grace of God over that, then we get this present thing taken care of, and this is the grace of God, guess what? We go on for the glory of God, for the future. Paul said, I've done something wrong. Would you forgive me? When's the last time you've asked someone to forgive you? Notice what again, verse 13, the latter part of that verse, he says, I myself was burdensome. You know what that is? That's conviction. <laughs> You ever been at all with someone? You ever been on the other side of a, someone's uh, a situation? And, and, and they're, just, they're just a wall there. They're, they're, just, a, they're just a burden. They're just, there's just something around you that you just can't get over and you can't get through it and you can't get around it. And man, I, just, I wish I could get rid of this burden. God said, forgive. And then when forgiveness would come, oh my, how lay. Why in the world, why in the world did I hold on to that burden? Why did I hold on to the past? Why did I hold on to the present? Let God's grace feed you that forgiveness and let God's grace take you to where you need to be. And when the burden rolls off, oh, I wish you'd have done that years ago. I'm telling you, there's nothing like, I've been on this place, I've been here, and there's nothing like the grace of God to give you that removal of that burden. Oh, the grace of God is needed for the past. The grace of God is needed for the present. And if you're ever going to go on for God, you're going to have to have the grace of God. Notice he says, forgive me this wrong. Verse 14, 15, he says, I will very gladly, notice this, this is tremendous. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Why could Paul say that? The grace of God. You ever been wronged? You know you have. You ever been misrepresented? No, you have. How can you go on? The grace of God. Well, they didn't do right. They didn't say this. They didn't say that. Look, human beings are human beings. You, if you're ever going, you ever think you're ever going to get to the place where people are not going to people, you're, you're deceiving yourself. I learned that a long time ago. You don't serve God for God, you're going to be highly disappointed. If, if you're not going to do things that for God's sake and for the Lord Jesus' sake and for the gospel's sake, you might as well hang her up now because you're going to be highly discouraged. Paul said, I've just come to the place in my life where I'm just going to give and I'm just going to be spent and be spent because of why? The grace of God. Because He's bestowed that grace upon me and I have just decided I'm going to take that grace and I'm going to extend it to those that need it. God works through grace to impart His will in your life to perfect you. I love this quote. The grace of God is a continual connection between He and us through your entire Christian life. It will always be grace that's the hub of your Christian life. It will always be grace that God uses to extend you to the future. It's always going to be grace. It was in the past, it was in the present, and it's going to be in the future. It's always, always, always the grace of God. He said in verse number 10, he said, I'm going to let my infirmities, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. Why? For Christ's sake. Do you think, honestly, beloved, do you think you're going to live this life for Christ and not be wounded? You're in the wrong, you're, you're in the wrong area. If you don't think on a, on a multiple basis that you're going to have to keep a short account of sin, you're going to have to keep a short account of, of offenses, of your words, my words, however... Look, that is a continual process. You're never going to broad brush grace and say, whew, I'm taking care of for the next 10 years. I'm good. All the offenses come. All the afflictions come. All the infirmities come. I'm good for the next 10 years. You forget it. 
It's a daily basis. Daily. The past, the present. If you're going to continue in the future, you've got to have the grace of God. Paul said, I've just decided because of grace, I'm going to continue. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd have quit the first week. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd have quit a long time ago, and you would have too. Why do we go on among the infirmities and the persecutions and afflictions? And why? The same reason Paul went on is because he's extended grace to you. And we have no other option. You can quit and get mad and give up on God, but you're going to forfeit something. You're going to forfeit his blessing. Because he is not going to remove the thorn, maybe, but he will give you the measure of grace to match it. And that's the amazing thing about God's grace. It don't matter what thorn it is for you. It's different for me. But whatever it is, that's the amazing thing. God's grace is sufficient for thee. He's got it for you. His grace is sufficient. Father, would you?